Today, we have immense pleasure to invite Professor Remy Herrera to give a lecture related to his new book entitled Money from the Power of Finance to the Sovereignty of the Peoples. The book is coming out in English in the Global University series with Palgrave Macmillan and in Chinese as Global University Alternative Thought series with the Oriental Press in China. Professor Herrera came to Hong Kong in 2017 to give a series of lectures to Global U on development theory and growth theory and on Cuba-US relationships and internationalism. These are available on the Global University website. We are also very pleased to invite Professor Wim Dixon to be moderator for this session. Professor Dixon holds a PhD in social sciences from the Netherlands and is a former administrator for the United Nations. And he is a senior researcher on globalization and post-capitalist alternatives. He is coordinator of the International Crisis Observatory, founding member of the Global University for Sustainability, and one of the founders of the Latin American Society of Political Economy. You can find the publications co-authored by Professor Dixon for free downloads on the Global University website. The two books are 200 Years of Marx and also For a New Civilization, the Multipolar Project. Today, we thank our English Chinese interpreters, Huan Xiaomei and Li Menghong, and our Spanish English interpreters, Maria Paula Vasil and Laura Lafiante. Thank you. So over to you, Wim. Okay, thank you very much, Keng Chi. Well, <clears throat> we are in the context of the collapse of modern civilizations and the future of humanity. And that means that we are leaving the civilization. And I think the West is at the end of the civilization. So I think you have to understand what this means. I think that we can typify the West as from Neolithics on that individual values are the most important values and not the common values. And I think the new civilization we are going to look for, that's just the opposite. That means we are a community and we are because of that community. That community may be national, but maybe cultural, maybe probably soon the world, we are a community. And in the East and even in Latin American pre-Columbian values, this is the opposite of the West. And in the West, we always have had imposition of civilizations. That's from the Romans on the feudalism and capitalism, it is always imposing you know, a new system, a new mode of production, and that is what is at the end of the possibilities. And it is very difficult for the West to make 180 grades change, to start from the common values, not from the individual values. And I think if you are looking to the economic policy of power, then we can see where are the origins of the end of any civilization or any mode of production in the West. It is always that improductive labor is the most, uh, as I said, imposes itself on the end of a mode of production as it does do at this moment in capitalism with financial capital, money, financial capital, fictitious capital. And if you are going in that improductive way of working, you destroy, you're destroying the basis of your power. And that is what I think is the, what at this moment is going on. And that's why the intervention of Remy is that important. It's just the most 
central point of uh, value theory and money and financial power. That is what is the big power now, but it is at the same time mining its own productive basis where it must sustain on. And we are going in a post-capitalist uh, period that we are living from rents, rents concentrating uh, more and more uh, wealth in fewer and even fewer hands or co companies, big companies and banks. And even if it is necessary, destruction to go on with this uh, way of accumulation. That's not anymore capitalism. It's already some rentism as federalism was and so on. And we see in uh, that in the new society is just have just big bases, and we can say that the multipolar world and China has a very important place over there. It is just supporting on productive labor, and I don't want to say that it's not any improductive labor in any mode of production uh, there exists in productive labor. And we have seen in China as well that the housing market is in big problems and so on, but they can handle it in a different way than saving the banks where we are speculating as they do in the West. And so <clears throat> I think uh, we are on the very final stage of capitalism and even of the Western civilization. And I think in, in this case, it is very important to present Remy uh, with his book about money and not just money. Remy <clears throat> his book is titled and King Chi already said, from the power of finance to the sovereignty of people. And I think we are in that transition to the sovereignty of people. And it requires uh, not only the end of capitalism, and I think that Walter will talk more or less about that, that's about what we talk about perestroika of the West, of the Western civilization, and first of all of the United States, but disintegration of the European as well. So he will focus on that. And I think that after Remy uh, finished his presentation, uh, Paolo, Paolo is very expert in fi uh, fictitious capital, and finance, financial capital. And I will think I will, he will focus a bit more on that subject. And then I think we have the complete uh, picture to be discussing about the, the change of civilization, the finishing Western civilization and the opening to the uh, multipolar world. I don't want to say that we all will develop this, but it is in this context that the presentation of Remy takes place and the discussions are done. Remy, I invite you and I will present you. And I have to, to look, I, of course, I know very well. I know the, the three members. We are all of the Observatory of International Crisis. And uh, with Remy, we shared Foro Economico Mundial uh, with Samir Amin. Foro Economico Mundial. Foro Mundial de Alternativas. I'm sorry, the lapsus, the bad lapsus. <laughs> um, and Remy is a researcher of the, when well, I have it in Spanish, but I will do this in Spanish. Remy is a researcher of the National Center in Scientific Research in University Paris 1 Sorbonne, 
and he has been a secretary of the Alternative International Forum, and he's a member of the uh, Crisis Observatory. I have been very brief in my presentation. We are great friends. We work together. We co-author books, and, and that's what we also do with Walter and with Paolo. Thank you, Remy, and I give you the floor. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks uh, for being connected and for listening this uh, session. Many thanks for the invitation and for the collective work uh, to the, the team of organizers of the forum, to Kinchi, to Jade, to all, all the team. That's uh, absolutely wonderful to, uh, to, have, to, to meet together uh, to gather together, uh, thanks to this uh, forum. I'm going to talk uh, to you about uh, this book, Monet, From the Power of Finance to the Sovereignty of the Peoples. I wrote at the invitation of the Centre Europe Tiers Monde, Centre Europe Third World, the CETIM in Geneva and uh, which was published uh, in January, in February uh, of, the, of the, the current year. Rather than talking about a particular point covered by this book, I will give you a brief overview of uh, the different chapters corresponding more or less to the major continents of the world, okay? And I hope uh, this will make you want to read it. So the, the, the book was, uh, was commanded and was uh, written in order to be accessible to uh, all activists, even if the topics of the book are quite difficult, money, monetary policy, and specifically, its external components, that is to say, uh, the exchange rates and currencies. That's a little bit complicated, but the writing of uh, the book uh, aim at being very, very, very accessible. So it's not a theoretical book, but rather an applied uh, one, uh, illustrated, with many concrete cases of countries uh, gathered together by continents. Uh, the, the, uh, the goal is to uh, seek to demystify money and monetary policy and to bring uh, these issues into the debates between progressives. This is the main goal. That is to say a goal to help activists realize that uh, the sovereign appropriation of money by peoples is a key condition for controlling their collective future. Of course, uh, monetary and financial questions are complex and they don't generate consensus, but it seems urgent to talk about them for the reason that the progressive forces and movements taken as a whole, I mean parties, uh, unions, and even associations in the countries of the North, but also in the countries of the capitalist global South, let's say, uh, with very few exceptions have no substantial political programs and sometimes no clear strategy at all on money, on banking, on finance, especially in cases where such left organization would rise to power, would get the power and would be brought to exercise the power, okay? I'm saying that in non-socialist countries, the organizations claiming to be in favor of socialism have very weak 
plans on monetary and financial issues. Uh, this is the case, more or less, with the left wing of the Democratic Party, currently around Bernie Sanders in the U United States. This is the case with the Labour Party around Jeremy Corbyn in Great Britain. This is the case with Die Linke, with Podemos in Spain, Die Linke in Germany, Podemos in Spain. This is also the case to a large ex extent with the recently created NUPES uh, or the, the new social, ecologic and popular union in France. And this is a hard reality, but this is the reality. And if the left doesn't have a program, a solid program, if the left doesn't have any precise, rigorously a uh, uh, funded program on money, on banking, on finance, it will be sure failure wherever it is. And obviously, so my book is not uh, for sure. It's not a, a political program. It does not have this ambition, but it is a call to discuss collectively, to discuss urgently what is the seniors of war, I mean money. And it's uh, rather important also because uh, conservative or reactionary political forces have no real interest in opening this debate on the role of money, neither in practice nor in theory. Because as you know, uh, for mainstream economics, money is said to be neutral. Uh, however, and uh, for sure, money is not neutral at all. It's not a neutral tool or a transparent veil. Money is a social relation. Money is a complex reality. Uh, it's a contradictory reality, just as inflation does reflect in its own way, the intensity of power conflicts within a given society. So money is power. It's, of course, uh, an economic issue based on truth, on, on trust, based on the confidence of the community in it with psychological dimensions, with even imaginary dimensions. Uh, plus an, uh, an, an, an identity character, I mean, uh, which can be identified, uh, for example, in the symbols affixed uh, to banknotes or to coins. But above all, money is political. Money is an attribute of power. Money is an attribute of national sovereignty. This is what I discuss in chapter one, dealing with the purposes and modalities of existence of money, emphasizes, uh, emphasizing uh, 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 credit uh, as a creation of money that can be converted into capital. Uh, I had uh, in each chapter of the book uh, boxes uh, on specific points. And at the end of the book, I also added uh, appendices on the history of monetary facts and on the history of uh, monetary thought, plus a glossary at the end. So in this chapter one, I added two boxes, uh, one on the ultra rich, that is to say the owners of financial oligopolies who control uh, transnational corporation uh, and which uh, uh, who dominate uh, all economic sectors and another uh, box, uh, uh, a small one, but uh, it's uh, on, uh, 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 and I believe so, an important point uh, on Russia. Uh, uh, from an historical point of view, I mean, from the Soviet attempt. 
uh, from the Soviet attempt to abolish money after the Bolshevik revolution in 1917 up to uh, the post-1991 uh, de facto demonetization uh, during the dissolution of uh, the USSR. Chapter two is uh, about the monetary hegemony of steel, uh, in fact, I mean, uh, steel effective uh, monetary hegemony of the United States and the domination of the US dollar as a key global currency, as unit of account on the external credit markets. And uh, the US dollar, which is also, and above all, the number one monetary and financial problem for all the countries in the world, worldwide. So I start by presenting the history of high finance born in the United States at the end of the 19th century, then placed uh, under control after the Great Depression of the 1929 before returning to power with neoliberalism, what is called neoliberalism, uh, in the 70s, okay? First in the United States and then uh, on the world planet. Uh, with the uh, abandonment of the, the convertibility of dollar in gold, with the shift towards flexible exchange rates, with the shift towards deregulated financial markets, and thus uh, with the, the uh, world monetary chaos, to say it briefly, the, the rise in uh, interest rates and the expansion of fictitious capital. Then I analyzed the period going from the 1997-1998 currency crisis to the 2007-2008 systemic crisis, focusing on the effects of the US dollar on the community of independent states currency, and more specifically on the ruble at that time. That is from when Putin came to power, okay? Then uh, I examine the post-2008 monetary policy shock of the so-called quantitative easing. And after that, the counter shock of its tightening from 2014 on with its destabilizing effects everywhere for every country in the world. And finally, I explain, I explain how the United States has managed so far to impose an unconditional surrender on the world and how the, the US dollar is used as a deterrent weapon in the economic wars laid by Washington, not only against its foreign enemies, but even against its rivals. I mean, uh, its, its northern uh, uh, rivals. And this in particular through extraterritorial sanctions. For sure, all this must stop and resistance is mounting. Uh, in this uh, chapter two, I have added two boxes, one on the pre-revolutionary Cuba in order to understand how the United States uh, mistreated Cuba and how the control of Cuba was a very uh, first step in the US march towards its world hegemony. I mean, from the end of the 19th century till uh, the, the, just before the revolution of 1960, uh, 1959, sorry. And the other box is on Israel in order to explain uh, how the United States uh, in 1985 saved the Israeli economy, which would otherwise 
have collapsed surely in 1985. And I explained how Israel's relay role for the U.S. Uh, domination in the region is ensured in partnership with Saudi Arabia and the Gulf Emirates. Okay, so the famous uh, clash of civilizations, uh, when it comes to big money, becomes the clinking of champagne flutes uh, to celebrate the 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 joint plundering of the world by the leaders of the three uh, monotheistic religions. Chapter uh, three is about Europe. Uh, I'm French, so it uh, the, the chapter begins by returning to 1981 and the so-called socialist between inverted commas socialist experience in france which uh, was a failure for sure in particular because it chose uh, to remain within the framework of the european monetary system okay and it according to me it was a harmful choice because the euro is not a progress. The Euro is a project of the German dominant classes, the other European dominant classes being submitted to them. And this is a project which is clearly anti-democratic, anti-national, anti-social, a project without fiscal regulation, without budgetary redistribution without social harmonization from above. That is to say that the Eurozone is not an optimal monetary zone, but rather a, 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 a maximum monetary straight jacket. The European Central Bank does not finance the European states, it prohibits them from financing each other. It prevents devaluation externally, but it forces wages to be devaluate, deva devaluated internally, devalued internally, sorry. And this is a very important point. And we have seen the catastrophic results of all of this during the 2010 debt crisis and in the way in which Greece was bled uh, like the other pigs, as they said so elegantly, okay? The Euro is in reality a new Deutschmark designed as West Germany absorbed the GDR. We will have to leave this single currency. We will have to exit from, from the single currency, not from the euro It's in itself. Since among the options available today, the best one, or let's say the least worth solution would be the joint, according to me, the joint issuing of national currencies and of a common currencies, a, co a common currency with a central bank from whom the state can borrow with a strong exter uh, exchange rate controls and for sure with new bank's duties, very strict duties for the commercial banks, okay? Leaving the single currency won't solve all the problem because, uh, or, or unless it is uh, integrated, it is part of a, prog or a process of deep social transformation, okay? Monet is important, but it's not all. <laughs> there are many other problems. So uh, the, the most important is to, uh, to understand that the perspective to modify uh, uh, the, uh, the monetary policy is to be integrated in a 
process of social transformation of uh, much more wide, okay? Much wider, sorry. So uh, I also discuss cases of countries whose currency is not the Euro. For example, the UK uh, with uh, Brexit and Denmark uh, that negotiated an opt out or Sweden that blocked the uh, second version of the European ex exchange rate mechanism, or even countries that are not members of the European Union, like Norway, oil-rich Norway, or Iceland, that uh, decided to nationalize, to nationalize the most important private banks and to put corrupt bankers in jail. <laughs> what a good idea, no? And wh why not for the rest of Europe to put in jail, I mean, corrupt and cr criminal bankers when they are identified and judged for sure hmm? and condemned for, for that. But till now, almost nothing is, uh, has been done. And I wonder also about the attitude to have vis-a-vis -vis Russia, which is European too. But the book was written before the war. Hmm? It was published in, in February. Uh, uh, in this chapter, uh, one box is on Germany, haunted by his, its past. I mean by uh, hyperinflation, but also by uh, uh, deflation, because Germany uh, uh, met the two problems, hyperinflation and just after a decade after in the in the 30s uh, uh, deflation and after as a consequence the fundamentalism the fundamentalism of the, the Buba of the Bundesbank uh, influence influenced by uh, ordo liberalism in particular. And the other box is on Switzerland. Uh, and its uh, banking secrecy, which is officially lifted, but which is in fact still effective. Chapter four is on Africa. African countries, uh, often poorer, uh, are disturbed, even those with fixed exchange rate regimes, by strong pressures on their currencies when commodity prices vary a lot and this is this is the case right now but it was the case even before the the the, the wall movement of inflation the current movement of inflation do do not forget that the foreign exchange market and the commodity markets are conductive to speculation also because they are less regulated than uh, stock exchange, okay? So I discuss countries with flexible, uh, African countries with flexible regimes, such as uh, Nigeria or uh, Egypt, all of them are subject to the IMF, almost of all of them, because Algeria is an exception, uh, uh, because it uh, excludes recourse to the IMF and organizes, uh, let's say, an organized depreciation of its currency. For sure, it's not a paradise, but it's a kind of resistance against IMF. Do you understand? But I also study much sm smaller countries. Let's, let's take the example of Gambia with the Dalassi, the, its currency. Gambia has its own currency. Gambia is a very small country, but Senegal, although bigger, does not, <laughs> has no own, Senegal has no own currency. Why? Because there is the CFA franc, the franc, of the African financial community. In fact, there are three different 
uh, CFA France, one for the Western part of Africa, I mean the so-called French <laughs> Western part of Africa, the other for the center, and the last one for the Comoros. And this system is a French anachronism. <laughs> and additionally, it's a shame. Uh, very recently, the president of France and of Ivory Coast, um, uh, Macron and uh, Alassane Ouattara, the two presidents, re uh, recently changed the name of the CFA, Frank. Right now, the, officially, the CFA Frank does not exist. And they call that, the, the, the new CFA Francs, they call that the eco. But for sure, they did not change its reality apart from very few concessions, okay? But there is a big problem. The name ECO was already taken by the ECOWAS, which includes Nigeria, which includes Gam uh, Ghana and other African countries. ECOWAS means uh, Economic Community of Western African States, and it's much larger than Waimu, that is to say the, let's say the French monetary union around the CFA franc, okay? The Waimu is the West African Economic and Monetary Union um, controlled by France, okay? And the, the, what I mean is that the macron Ouattara duo wanted to sabotage the ECOWAS common currency project. Please note that this uh, ECOWAS project, monetary project, included Waimu, that is to say the, 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 the French, uh, the, the French control uh, uh, countries in Africa, okay? That is to say that Macron and Ouattara uh, uh, made a, a coup de force aimed at concealing a setback by France. France had to back down, but they dissimulated that uh, uh, by a change of the name of the CFA front. But the reality still exists, more or less, it's, it's still the, the same reality. My position on this point is that in the interest of the African uh, peoples, and as well as in the interest of the French people itself, who should oppose the imperialist, the, the neo-colonial strategy of its dominant classes, uh, I, uh, I believe that a, a good solution would be to reject the makeover of the CFA franc under French supervision and to get out of it by walking on the path to a potentially pan-African common currency by supporting temporarily the ECOWAS project, and even by in trying to include in this project, in this ECOWAS pr project, uh, some Central African countries, some of them, or at best, all of them. It's not the first best solution, but it's, it seems to be, according to me, according to me, uh, a lesser evil. And for this new currency, the ECOWAS ECO, the ECOWAS ECO, uh, which is in process, which is, uh, which is going to be created, I hope soon, uh, and which is likely to expand its area of influence over the continent, the African continent, uh, I believe that the, mo the most appropriate would probably be a floating exchange rate regime but control with a peg on a basket of currency reflecting the diversity of these countries' foreign trade, okay? There, is a, a, there are two boxes in this chapter, but bon, just to, uh, to say a word uh, on, on, on them, one is on the bypassing of, uh, in the past, huh? the bypassing of the South African anti-apartheid laws by the private banks of the North, 
and the other box is on the collaborate collaboration of western public and private funders of uh, 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 on the genocide in uh, Rwanda. Uh, it's uh, muy feo, como se dice en América Latina. Uh, chap chapter five is on Oceania. Uh, this region is often forgotten, but is yet revealing of the archaism, not of the peripheral traditional societies of this region and of their ways of thinking, but the archaism rather of the forms of monetary domination of the center there. Uh, that is to say, Australia and New Zealand as main relays of US hegemony. Oceania is a scattered space, but hier hierarchical, very hierarchical under the control of the dollar. For sure, the, the US dollar, but also the other dollars. I mean, the Australian one and that of uh, New Zealand. And uh, very few countries, six in fact, have uh, their own uh, money, uh, their, sorry, their own currencies, okay? Samoa, Tonga, Fiji, uh, Solomon Island, Vanuatu, and Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is the largest peripheral economy in the region and the only one to have a flexible exchange rate which is in reality or which functions in reality as a, an intermediate uh, regime. So I explain Papua New Guinea's monetary ties to Australia and the process of monetization, but in connection with land owner, ownership and customary rights. I mean, the resistances of the Papua New uh, PNG people against this process of uh, introduction of the capitalist uh, uh, mechanism in their society. It's extremely in interesting and uh, unknown, uh, generally unknown. The, 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 the courage and the heroism of these people, uh, uh, in particular against the big mining corporations, okay? The mechanisms of submission of uh, PNG uh, go through the balance of payments and combine the action of corporation, private corporation, transnationals, and the action of the states. I mean, uh, nar narrowly imbricated, both the central and the peripheral states, including their armies, because the military are in the business for sure. Uh, in Australia as in PNG. But uh, uh, I focus the end of this chapter on the franc CFP. Uh, that, that is the Pacific Financial Community Franc. Or if you prefer, the franc, the, the currency used by the French colonies of uh, New Caledonia, of Wallis and Futuna and of French Polynesia, okay? These territories have exchange rate regimes even more restrictive, even harder than the African CFA France. And this leads me to propose alternatives, particularly in the event of future independence, I mean possible future independence of these territories by suggesting the option of a sovereign currency issued by a local central bank there with its own uh, foreign exchange reserves and with, uh, pretty sure it, it's possible, uh, a regional cooperation between uh, uh, Ocea or Oceanian uh, countries. Chapter six is on Latin America. 
rebellious Latin America on the, the way to its second independence. We know that several countries in the region have chosen to substitute their currency with the US dollar. This is the case of Equator and probably at the root of the concerns of the citizen revolution, the troubles uh, it encounter. Uh, but this is also the case of Panama and um, other uh, tax even islands, okay? But other countries have not yet succeeded in getting out of the orbit of the United States, such as Mexico, uh, the largest uh, Spanish speaking country, which is caught in the vortex of the waves of crisis caused by the US uh, hegemony. And it was especially uh, the case during the crisis of the peso in uh, uh, 1994. Uh, that is at the, at, at the time of the, the accession to NAFTA. But it's uh, above all the resistances to imperialism and or to capitalism that focused my attention, whether it is the experience of uh, Kirchner in Argentina, the two Kirchner, the two of them, which were not as bad as it was said. I, I hope that I hope that Walter will allow <laughs> will allow me to say that Kirchner, uh, uh, which uh, uh, was not as bad as it was it was said, uh, and also the experience of uh, Petista uh, Brazil with Lula and Dilma's PT uh, Workers Party, which was not as good at, as it was said, and which is probably uh, no stranger to the current drama uh, of the country with Bolsonaro. I hope that Paolo will allow me to say that too. But in other countries of Latin, Latin America, uh, advances have been possible despite harsh external uh, constraints and internal contradiction exacerbated by extractivist models based on oil or gas with, uh, within distant contexts and with very various uh, results like in Bolivia or in Venezuela. But in fact, this is the case of Cuba that I, st I studied uh, more because it's the most uh, in-depth socialist uh, experience and the most assertive reconquest of monetary sovereignty. Uh, it was like that uh, from the very beginning of the revolution. And even after the dissolution of the Comecon, most uh, especially from the dollarization process between 1993 to 2004, uh, to, uh, up to the de-dollarization process, which uh, took, in fact, uh, uh, more, uh, a longer period, uh, more than 18, 18 years, and which finally uh, ended in January 2021 uh, with the unification of the, uh, the Cuban peso, unconvertible, and the Cook convertible, OK? Cuba. Cuba is very, very, very important for us to, to discuss, to, end, to understand, because it proved, it proved that monetary resistance is possible, even for a very small country, uh, additionally under embargo, okay, under US embargo. Uh, plus two, two boxes in this chapter, one on Colombia, uh, which uh, served as uh, with the, the, the speculative bubbles uh, serve as a laboratory for the US finance in terms of uh, Morgan loans, mortgage, mortgage loans. Uh, this uh, 10 years before the subprime crisis. And the other, one, the other box is on IET uh, with an explanation of the historical role 
of France in the blocking of the, de of the development of IT by an odious uh, burden, uh, uh, debt burden, okay? Chapter seven is on, uh, is on um, Asia in search of a better future and for itself and for the world. Uh, uh, close to uh, the introductive words uh, by Wim uh, at the beginning of this session. So several points only on this chapter. First, the, the so-called Asian crisis. This crisis, so that is to say, uh, 1997-1998. Uh, this crisis was in reality originated in the effects on Asia of changes of modifications in the monetary policy of the US Fed, which caused panic, which caused the dollar to appreciate and which caused the fixed exchange rate regimes to explode in Asia. So it's not an ASEAN crisis, it's a US crisis uh, 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 imported by ASEAN countries, okay? And uh, as it is known, uh, it is the countries which distanced themselves from the IMF dictates that resisted the best to this shock. This is the case for Malaysia, but this is, uh, even more so for Vietnam, okay? And by contrast, South Korea, which remained totally submitted to the IMF, has been hit hard and completely changed, I mean, negatively, with a capital ownership structure penetrated by Western transnational and with a South Korean economy turned into a financialized economy. The second point is on the two 2000, uh, 2001 crisis and the form it took in Japan, where the central bank, the Bank of Japan, uh, then invented the, the unconventional policy, monetary policy. I mean, the so-called quantitative easing. It was invented in uh, Japan at that time uh, and consisting to increase liquidity by creating credit money, allowing massive purchases of public debt securities or by uh, purchases of assets of commercial banks and domestic private company, including of dubious quality. And point three is on the 2008 crisis and it's destructive consequences in Asia, but a crisis to which China was able to respond. I mean, China was even able to lead regional cooperation uh, at that time, okay? And compared to China, other countries look pale, like Modi's India, uh, which uh, recently, uh, demonetized in a very bad way, or Erdogan's Turkey, which jumps from a banking crisis to a financial crisis. So it's a crisis uh, all the time there. Thus, it's precisely China's monetary policy that must be examined and, according to me, that must be praised because China didn't back down in the face of the violence of the financial markets, then China built a monetary grid wall in order to protect its, itself. And also because China placed, placed its currency at the service of development, at the service of a strategy of development, which is very rare in the global south. So I explain uh, how it works, but also the risks posed to China, in particular when Yuan goes internationalized and when the system of monetary defense is relaxed uh, by the Chinese authorities, there is a risk. 
uh, two boxes here. One is on the on Lebanon, and uh, whose people is strangled by a dependency uh, on the U.S. dollar and on the rapacity of the local bourgeoisie. Okay, and the other one, the other box is on microfinance. I mean, the the hidden face of uh, micro uh, mi micro credit. Hmm? Finally, and this is the, the last chapter, chapter eight, uh, uh, this chapter analyzes recent changes in the forms of money, such as crypto assets and the resulting risks and also the possible alternatives. This chapter shows that, first of all, uh, reformist between inverted commas, reformist anti-crisis policies won't get us out of the systemic crisis, nor out of the currency wars, as long as banks are free to speculate on stock exchange, on, on stock markets, okay, as, uh, as uh, Wim uh, said uh, at the beginning. Uh, this chapter also dismantles the illusion of some false solution like helicopter money or fiscal money or local currencies or ethical banking and its uh, religious versions like the Islamic uh, finance, for example, or microfinance again, okay? Despite some attractive aspect and even if some of these so-called solutions, according to me, they are not solutions. Hmm? But uh, 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 some of them are quite sympathetic, for sure. Hmm? Uh, for example, the, the, the local currencies. But they are too limited. Hmm? Uh, well, then uh, the chapter moves on to cryptocurrencies. No, they are thousands. Uh, they are innovation, surely. They are important innovation because they carry a potential for transformations of money. I mean that if they had an economic base and or a political will behind them, they could replace currencies with given conversion rates, for sure, they could create credits, they could participate in the metamorphosis of capital into virtual money. And for such reason, just also because they are threatened in the hegemony of the US dollar, the crypto assets are a note of contradiction between individual initiatives, strategy of high finance and of other major private actors, such as the Gamam, plus Tesla, plus Uber, plus Netflix, all that. And for sure, a third actor, the state and its organized responses. What is at stake here is a reconfiguration of fictitious money, a reconfiguration of social relations of power. And with them, with these uh, uh, crypto assets, the geopolitical battle between the fractions of capital takes on larger scope because there is now a cryptocurrency war, including between the financial empires. And this is a point uh, which has been uh, very well studied by Walter and by Wim. Uh, within the framework, giving the impulsion to the uh, International Org uh, Observatory of Crisis, uh, they uh, worked on, <coughs> sorry, they worked on the conflict between the, the what they call uh, the globalist and the continentalist, that is to say the globalist uh, forming a, a global network of financial power uh, around uh, Citigroup, around Barclays, around the Lloyds and all that, all, all these uh, 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 financial oligopolies. And on the other side, the continentalists 
with uh, JP Morgan, with Goldman Sachs, uh, with Bank of America, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the continentalist being more attached to or remaining more attached to their national uh, uh, territories, if you want. So uh, it, it, it's, it is very important to understand that. I mean, that there is a conflict inside the elite inside the uh, within the the financial oligopolies themselves uh, well uh, before that for sure some states uh, uh, enter the battle and it's the case for china because uh, before uh, the introduction of uh, crypto uh, currencies by uh, some financial oligopolies, uh, China, after having prohibited the use of private assets by its uh, public entities, China's uh, central bank launched the, a state digital currency, uh, which was tested in 2016, and uh, which intended to fight against the uh, laundering of dirty money, but above all, uh, intended to be a medium of exchange for the construction of the new Silk Road by replacing by replacing the U.S. dollar and by opposing the attempts of financial oligopolies to introduce their own uh, cryptocurrencies. Okay, and for sure, before all that, uh, things had already been done. Uh, the 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 Sucre. Uh, within the ALBA, within the Bolivarian Alliance, the Banco Sur in Latin America, but also the, the uh, China's uh, Development Bank in Asia and the Bank of the BRICS, all that, all that. The, uh, the alliance between China and Russia uh, uh, at the end, from, from the end of 2014, uh, with a swap, a swap line device uh, helping each other, uh, with the uh, launch, the launching of uh, the project of a new world currency, the Petro Yuan Gold, uh, encored on gold but also based on oil. Okay, all that, all this innovation plus other innovation, more, uh, more recent innovation by uh, China, that is to say uh, uh, the introduction of oil future in Yuan in the Shanghai Stock Exchange or the issuing of Yuan denominated derivatives for metals in Hong Kong and so on, okay? And all, all that uh, result, resulted in the fact that in early 2018, Russia, announced that its financial system could operate outside the US dollar. So this is a very important uh, information, okay? And other countries are also moving forward to roll back the hegemony of the US dollar. So today, and I can conclude, uh, I don't know exactly if it's okay for the time, but uh, I, 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 can, I can continue, but I believe that you are tired. <laughs> so better is for me to conclude and to open the, the discussion and eventually to introduce uh, uh, other ideas, ideas uh, or responses in the discussion. But finally, uh, everybody uh, has to understand that big steps have been taken in the direction of a multipolar world of currencies. And this is the most important for all of us. Uh, in the book, I have also a proposal for sure at the national level and at the international level, but we could discuss that uh, within the, the discussion, okay? If you, within the, de uh, within the debate, if you prefer. Okay, I don't, re I, I don't remember exactly at what time I begin. So sorry if I was too long. <laughs> I'm very impressed. The, you gave a picture in time. You gave a picture in the global scope. I think uh, every 
part of the world was touched. I think that is very incredible a task you did, really impressive. Um, I think uh, everybody in the world sense, feels connected with this view. Uh, and probably they might have different opinions here or there, but I think it is a, a very important overview of money in the world and uh, the different uh, focus uh, you develop over there. And also in time uh, with some projection to the future, I think it is a very useful and important uh, contribution for everybody. It is really a basic book, I think, for, for a lot of people and a lot of uh, countries to have this in their hands. And I think that is a lot of work you did in the first time and uh, an incredible good view about the context. Yeah. Okay, then we go to, uh, <clears throat> to Paolo. I invite you, Paolo, to have your intervention. Paolo Nakatani, I do say it uh, in Spanish, sorry, because I wrote it in Spanish. Es profesor del Departamento de Economía. Paolo Nakatani is professor at the Department of Economics of Espiritu Santo University in Victoria, Brazil. He has been president of the Brazilian Society of Political Economy. And I also believe that he is the founder of the Latin American Society of Political Economy. We were working there together. And he is also, he has been working with the um, magazine of this society, the journal, and he's also a member of the International Crisis Observatory. So, Paulo, you have the floor to add, to complement, to make your comments or whatever you want to comment based on Remy's presentation to give your view, your approach. I invite you to speak more about fiction, fiction capital, because I think that that's a point that is very important for you and for the context. So you have the floor, Paul. Thank you very much, Wim. And I would also like to thank Kim Chi, Jade, and all the group who is organizing, who are organizing this event. So good morning, Remy, Walter, Wim, everyone. We do need this kind of discussion among us. I agree. So I think I have 15 minutes, right? I am. I will not be speaking long, so I will not be able to develop uh, the ideas deeply, but today's topic, I think, is based on three main things, money, the power of finance, and sovereignty of peoples, of the peoples. So I think that we can debate on these things at a more general level, maybe abstract or theoric, theoretical level, or we can go into something more concrete from a historical point of view. Remy did both things, which is quite complex to do indeed, because sometimes we lose the specificities, the specific context. But I think that the first important thing I would say is that, in my opinion, money is a way that capital takes. It's important because we usually use money and capital as if they were synonyms, as if we were talking about the same thing. But I do think it is important to make a difference because money is something that appeared in humanity a thousand years ago. Merchandise, uh, commodities and money. Even Marx calls commercial capital or monetary capital or banking capital as different ways of calling that. So capital, the capital that rules the ways of production in the current times, starts 
as of the 16th, 16th century in Europe. And it starts to create a world system that is structured by a kind of hierarchy. Within this process, we have two more things in addition to money and capital. There is the state and the, the armed forces from the beginning of the capitalist era. So the creation of a colonial system afterwards, the neo-colonial system after imperialism. And to, to the current date, we still, we can still see the development of new ways of domination and subordination of the peoples. As we said at the beginning in Africa, as Remy was explaining in his presentation. In Polynesia as well. So we need to understand or to analyze things as a whole, from a broad perspective, money is the way by which capital is moving. Capital can only move by means of money. But in the accumulation of capital, part of the capital is accumulated in the way of money, and another part is accumulated in a more active way by means of work or merchandise. So money capital gets to more complex ways, such as the fictitious capitals. But I don't want to talk about that today because I'm going to talk, yeah, let, let's talk about the relations more. Let's talk about the relation about capital, the power, of finance and the sovereignty of the peoples. Why? Because with the creation of a world system, the peoples were subjected, were subordinated by the colonial powers. But later on with the independence in the, let's say, 19th and 20th centuries, the domination, the way in which they were subordinated changed. However, I think that in order to create the whole system, it was necessary to have a military power. From the large ships of the 16th century. So the capital was there moving. At the beginning, the state was not capitalist. It was an absolute state. This state evolved and transformed itself with internal class struggles in the different countries, both in the central countries as well as, the, as, well as in the peripheral countries. So those struggles were specific to each country and they took place in different ways and they reached a socialist revolution of 1917, the creation of the Soviet Union, the revolution in China in the year 49, the Cuban revolution in the year 59. And in many countries, many countries could have had a revolution if they hadn't had an external intervention. And I'm talking both about Europe and about, and about Latin America. For example, the civil war in Spain, the dictatorship in Portugal, the dictatorship in Brazil, the dictatorship in Chile. So I would also say that the development of capital with class struggle Capital becomes international, but class struggles also become more international. Therefore, 
the more advanced capitalist states, the dominating ones, will defend capital throughout the world. In addition to that, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the left at the world level is, let's say, more adrift than it already was. So the left started going further and further adrift for more than half a century now. And now we have no other option. But Remy was saying something important as well. When you talk about money, monetary policy, how to manage the currency, uh, things that are analyzed within capitali capitalism, the more developed kind of capitalism, those are different ways of analyzing how to manage money. Money, for example, the dollar, let's take dollar as an example, is a very strong currency. Um, the agreement of Bretton Woods, the convention of gold as reserves against the dollar. So what was the use of money then so that everyone can finance the US? I think that there is an, a wrong idea among economists that they say that this is due to neoclassic economists and also it has an influence of the mercantilists. They say that the country has to have a positive result in their balance of payment. The US has a negative balance of payment for a long time, for decades, I should say. So it means that the whole world is sending merchandise, true merchandise, goods to the US, they receive dollars in exchange for that, and they go, they send that money back to the US by buying treasury bonds. So the capital and the merchandise, the commodities become money, and then they become securities. So, as long as the countries do not buy merchandise or commodities in the US, but they buy those commodities elsewhere, they have received commodities for free. Countries such as Brazil, for more than 10 years, have more than $300 billion of reserves in American securities. So we can sell merchandise and commodities to the rest of the world. We receive dollars and we can pay dollars back to the US. China has more than, I think more than $1 trillion in reserves. Japan, I think $1 billion as well. And the capital of the US, let's analyze what happens with that? The state has to manage the currency on the one hand, and they have to manage capital on the other. Those two policies are mixed, are intertwined, in order to deal with the interests of the capital as such in general, not of special or individual capitalists. So we can have policies against certain factions of the capital or certain productive sectors, if you want to call them, or service sectors. Now, for the benefit of the capital, all of that. That's why all this policy that goes against the quantitative theory that many countries are following in terms of how to manage their own currencies, I believe that this current, this policy creates money to buy devalued bonds and that money goes back to the central banks and it is distributed later on. So this is something that people do not really understand. 
money in itself is created and it is destroyed every single day. Within this process, you are moving the capital, moving them both with like inside the countries and internationally. That creates a power, but that power is backed by the military. From the very beginning, after the war, with the power of the US, and even to the current date, even today, nowadays, with the war, the military power is behind all of this. Even more than gold, I should say, even more than oil, I should say. So the armed forces of the US are stronger and they are, I mean, they include all the countries that are part of the Northern Treaty against Russia. But I think that the following step is to support Russia and think about what is against China. The power of money is the power of capital that is supported by military power, political, cultural power, all the other dimensions that was done through a system of independence of the peoples. And this affects every country in, in a differentiated way. For example, the currency in Senegal, Zambia, these are different stories. Senegal was a French colony. Zambia was an English colony. I'm not sure. Because these financial regions, as far as I know, are the result of French colonialism. The British colonialism did not produce that. The American imperialism reached, led many countries to introduce you or use the dollar. But the most important dependence in terms of money is the case of Ecuador that, that uses the US dollar as the currency. So we have a system, a form of production that can be analyzed in an abstract or theoretical way, but this has been historically developed with many different uh, characteristics. But let's say the most relevant aspects of money and finance is to subdue peoples. But in the past, the countries created colonies to uh, exploit them and obtain uh, wealth that was the primitive accumulation of capital period. So since the beginning, countries, it's uh, uh, Europe first and the US subject other peoples and this has changed. And at the beginning of the 22nd century, there are different ways. Since the 70s, the capital over accumulates. So we have an excess of capital. And the main 
form is the money. This has developed the financial system that we have today. And to me, it is going through a crisis for several decades. But this crisis is a uh, downward trend in the uh, growth rate of economy. And this crisis that can be called a stagnation or, or as Remy said, the senile phase of capitalism, uh, today it is expressed in many crises food, social crisis, environmental crisis, and capital today cannot keep growing at a fast pace as it occurred during a serious crisis and the path followed by capitalist uh, development led capitalism to destroy the planet. Could you uh, con conclude, Paolo, because we are running out of time. So people have to have their own sovereignty and the problem is not ending with the capital or with money. A socialist revolution so that we can rebuild society and the resources of the planet. Because if we were to continue with capitalism, that could be the end of humanity. That is what we see today in the different trends. Thank you. I think I have exceeded my time. No, no worries. Thank you, Paulo. I believe that your idea that capital, the money in its different forms is becoming stronger, supported by improductive labor because of the content and the military forces are improductive as well and as they do not contribute to the reproduction of civil economy. So I agree there are more improductive labor forces if we compare that to the American capital. So the power has to do with monetary circulation and improductive labor in general, including the armed forces, but with the same um, development, they have the economic basis which is uh, fractured, it cannot be sustained. Uh, this power cannot be sustained. And that's very important. And if we compare this to the multipolar world, that in my opinion is a new revolution, different to that revolution that we had in mind, China leading this multipolar revolution, we have productive forces and the reproduct and the the uh, support the connection with housing to the people and intermediate banks and i believe that we are a work community and we can live all together here not necessarily under the um, subordinate way, which has been the Western way, the common good and exploitation are not excluded, but 
in capitalism and Western life since slavery, there is no common good. And it is possible to build that through that multipolar world. So that's the path. More nations are able to be absorbed and incorporated and affiliated so that we can end capitalism. In my opinion, that is what Remy has said. There is no capitalism in the US. There's rentism, a fiscal way of producing. They live out of rent, not of production. So it is completely unproductive and finite. It is the decadence that is very evident. So that could be very interesting as a topic of debate in general, but it is very illustrative what you have mentioned, this power that in my opinion is unproductive, which has been built since the beginning of the capitalism as finance, uh, capitalism or trade capital, but then that as, uh, affects the system and this no longer has to do with productive labor and it turns into improductive labor and suffocates the foundation on which it has to be supported and that is uh, the crisis. As congratulations for this presentation of this fusion and i would like to listen to walter so he can present internal uh, contradictions uh, among capitals we can also contribute to change not only the revolution and the fight uh, to obtain a new regime but also the internal um, collapse of the system. So Walter is a geopolitics, hegemony, and communications professor in the Universidad de la Plata, Argentina, director of political and economic research center, the CEP, and secretary of the International Crisis Observatory. I always make brief introductions and Walter, I invite you to um, talk about internal contradictions, which I believe it is a very important topic. Yes, thank you. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be able to participate in this uh, presentation of Remy's book. And as you have mentioned, Winnen, I will discuss those issues that it has to do with class struggle within capital and the different representations, as we have mentioned before. This, as you have said, the perestroika in the US that we are witnessing today at the time that is quite relevant, but the history of the perestroika in the US is based on their uh, previous perestroika in the Soviet Union. And when the Soviet Union was dissolved in 1991, there was a 1988 uh, Washington consensus and those fractions of cap finance cap capital, the globalist that was emerging, they were already confronting the old continental uh, finance capitalism that it became tricontinental after the 70s, as Remy was saying. And that confrontation to Washington consensus was a time to guarantee the fall of the Soviet Union and put pressure so that that could be achieved. That is important for us to remember. 
between 1991 and 1994, that oligarchy, globalist, unipolar that emerged, broke con Washington consensus and takes control of the Democrat Party in 1994 with, when it wins the elections. And this party is under the control of financial uh, capitalism. It had not occurred since Roosevelt. And that's very important because it did not occur just in the US, but since 2010, these occur in the Labour Party, just to mention an example. That financial global unipolarization takes control of the party, subordinating big uh, industrial uh, businessmen and the uh, labor uh, unions. The transnationalization of capital is accelerated from central countries to dependent countries, which we will later on call uh, the countries in the global south. The US, the European Union, Japan, and Asian Pacific, there is an accelerated dislocation towards Hong Kong and Shanghai, and Asia Pacific and its surroundings. But this has to do with China under the British control of the globalists. Now it is under British control. In 1994, Clinton uh, does, a, does away with Glass-Steagall and resources, global investment resources. This is an actor we should bear in mind because this is subject economic a strategic subject of global investment. And these global resources have a strategic need and to deny them, to deny a nation, institutions in the different nations and the institutions within capital at the level of nation states. Thus, it, needs to deny peoples and real production because it needs to restructure them in a new way so that they can be exploited by that global financial capital and they are built into a global financial network to deeply restructure capital and organize it because the way it was under industrial capital is no longer useful. It needs to destroy power created by industrial capital in the main central countries. Thus, these investment financial resources plus uh, leading uh, accelerated this unemployment are part of the destruction of that nation state under the control of financial capital in that industrial stage. On the other hand, the people and production in central countries are sacrificed in the altar of global investment um, resources and the lack of support from central banks under the control of these financial capitals, which are speculative and global investment resources. These migrates to the third world, illegal and informal labor forces without any unions. It migrates leaving the US, the European Union and Japan. The, those three had been dominated and controlled from the Marshall Plan in the 70s. 
global financial capital is unipolar, which is consolidated. The BIS, the International Bank, is the center of this new global financial network that controls most of the central banks, if not all of them, and the currency. The currency, as Paolo said, and Remy mentioned in his book, it begins to accumulate even most forms of capital. That's why these global investment funds have that speculative characteristic as parasites, and they make up this financial capitalist that is dominated by as a global parasite uh, financial oligarchy that is not articulated with real economy. It is not articulated in a committed and organic way. Its main aspect is to be on the main national and international havens. And as of then, the national states where they could also, they said that it was, they showed no more than 10% of their income. 90% remains at fiscal havens or at a different paranational state or anti-national area. They need to deny the national state as an institution in itself. So financial capital, which could be either continental or tricontinental from the Republican Party, and let me make another comment. In 1999, Bill Clinton authorized the free functioning of these new ways of capital, which is the global financial capital and all their institutions. So, and it continues saying that in 2001, the Twin Towers were attacked. What it represents, the collapse of the Twin Towers represents a war within within the capital, within capitalism, among different factions. Same thing will happen with the collapse of the Lehman Brothers in 2008, another act of war, but in the financial sector in 2008, with the collapse of the Lehman Brothers, financial capital that was lagging behind creates a clash on all the financial funds that started being developed. Of course, from then on, it was as centralized as possible, and it continued advan advancing until 2013, when there is a financial situation caused by 22 countries, which is what Bernanz said at the time, it was the Minister of Economy in the US back then. At that time, it was a financial war in different terms, but it was a war that was facing, facing or trying to face the new territoriality of the global financial capital, which is already present in 22 countries, mainly or most of which, as Remy said, were already the old countries, the old depending countries that were transformed into a new way, a new structure of a na nation state subordinated to the main capitals. So the European Union created the same maneuvers that took place in 2009, 2008. So from 2008, nine or 10 happened until the Brexit, all of that is part of the same process that at the beginning we saw happening in the third world. world. As of 2009 or 10, this happens even in the European Union. 
as Remy was saying in his summary of, of his own book. So let me move on. In 2014, what we saw is the first manifestation of what Remy said and what Paulo was also reinforcing. The BRICS multipolarism as a main player becomes apparent from the multipolar south of nations, peoples, and regions, creating a group of alternative financial institutions, alternative to the multipolar power in the meeting in Fortaleza in Brazil in 2014, where they show their financial institutions. And that's the first institution that was thought of from multipolarism. Those are specific alternatives to the IMF, to the World Bank. And why am I saying this? Because an alternative to dollar only appeared in 2021, 2022, as we were just mentioning in some of our articles. The coup d'etat and the invasion of the NATO to Ukraine to develop in the whole of Asia Pacific, a group of countries that would become labs, laboratories for nuclear arms to prepare the first nuclear coup. That was the single way in which NATO could continue advancing in the military way by using those countries. Main first in Russia and then China and India in the future, which are the two other key players in this scenario. The strategic defeat of NATO in Syria in 2016, after four years of war with the NATO and all the mercenaries, because that's the main feature of the mercenary forces, and that's the main feature of any empire in their decline phase. When you talk about professional forces with military and mercenary forces, that always shows the decline of the empires. So from the Roman Empire, from the collapse of the Roman Empire onwards, this marked the beginning of the end of the NATO and of the unipolar force. The defeat of the NATO in the elections of 2016 mark another key point in this process when they lose the government in the US with an agreement between Trump and the Bush, between Trump and the Rockefellers, Trump and Texas, Florida, Oklahoma, that is to say the parties or no, the so-called red regions in the US. So the situation becomes worse within the US. Sorry, Walter, can you wrap up? Yes. The global pandemic, the defeat of the vi virus, the paralysis of world uh, economics, the growth of 2% in the economy of China, those aspects show the decline on the one hand of capitalism, of this unipolar financial capitalism, and the strength of the BRICS in the, as the first engine or the first, the first engine, which in this case is also shown by a new perestroika, is shown by the NATO, the globalism, and what is currently happening now. In January 2022, Russia and the mutual aid agreement with Shanghai in January and February made an advance by destroying the laboratories in Afghanistan and then in Ukraine, so as to allow that, so as to allow that we can earn some time and so that the NATO can start rethinking that the future is no longer in its hands. 
based on the capacity that they had in the past since 1991. Uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fact that they were the single power which has the complete monopoly of the mass destruction forces. So I think that this is a contribution that complements what Remy said in his main presentation today, because to a certain extent, this also shows the whole history that Remy showed us throughout his book. So thank you, Wim, for, for the time. Thank you, Walter. And I do have a question. Um, uh, now there is the Q&A section, but I don't know where I can find the question or how it works. So could, could anyone clarify what I should do now for the Q&A? Michael, maybe you want to take the floor? Yes. Uh let me let me give me one oh let me unmute uh, can you hear me yes i can hear you okay well at first i wondered what uh global you uh was going to have to say about money uh i did not know of remy before i'm very happy with his talk and we have a very similar uh analysis in politics uh he's right to say that most socialists <coughs> have ignored uh, the role of theory and that means that most anti-imperialists uh, ha have ignored the role of money. But there is a great exception, and that's called modern monetary theory, or MMT. Uh, th that is becoming the dominant school uh, in the United States, and it was founded by Hyman Minsky, uh, who came from a Marxist uh, tradition, uh, as did I. We both knew the same people uh, uh, growing up in Chicago. Uh, the center of modern monetary theory was at uh, the University of Missouri in Kansas City, UMKC, uh, where I taught uh, and our department chairman was Stephanie Kelton, uh, who has written very clearly about uh, modern money being a fiscal creation, uh, a creation of government, not a commodity. Uh, she was the advisor to the socialist Senator Bernie Sanders and head of the uh, United States Senate Democratic Committee on Money and Banking uh, is their research person. Uh, Randy Ray, who is uh, a close associate of Minsky, uh, has written the most important textbooks on money. Uh, so I feel as if uh, 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 Remy and the others aren't aware that we're, there's a whole parallel group sharing his views, writing on the same subject, and uh, we really haven't uh, been in touch because uh, uh, that's how the system uh, works. Uh, we're more and more recognized as being the major experts in money, uh, although we don't wave uh, the magic, uh, the Marxist flag in it, but almost every recent uh, encyclopedia of money, such as the, uh, uh, the, the German encyclopedias, usually have me write the uh, opening article on the origins of money in ancient Mesopotamia. And the important thing to realize about money is that it's pre-capitalist, but it's always been a government function. People don't create money, uh, governments do. Uh, and they give value to money by accepting it in taxes. So to discuss money, you also have to discuss taxes. And that means who are you going to tax? And that means who's going to control the government? Will it be the rentier, the industrial capitalist class? Will it be the finance capitalist class? Uh, will it be uh, socialists uh, as in China? And uh, Remy said he was going to get to that uh, later uh, in the discussion. And that really is uh, the key issue because money is political. A commodity as such is not political. Money uh, is uh, political. Uh, private money, uh, bank credit, is uh, ba backed by debt owed to the banks, uh, creditor claims. Uh, that's not the case in uh, China, where the banks are public, and China creates uh, credit to spend into the economy. Uh, that's not what most uh, commercial banks do. All money is debt, and it primarily it began with the debts that were owed for taxes and other payments to the public sector, starting with the palaces in Sumer and Babylonia. Uh, on my website, uh, I have uh, 
my articles on this from encyclopedias, uh, but I urge you to read what the uh, modern monetary theorists uh, have today have to say here, because we're on the same page and we should work together to make it a critical mass. Uh, the key in analyzing money is taxation and what debts are money created to bring into being. Uh, you have uh, the key to money is a, a balance sheet relationship. If money is an asset to some people, it's a debt to somebody else. Who owes what to whom? Um, and last week uh, we had Eric Toisin, uh talking about uh, uh, the debt problem. That ultimately is a money problem, uh, especially the foreign debt problem that Eric and I have uh, spoken about because the one kind of money that governments cannot create is foreign currency because money is created by sovereign governments. So if uh, Latin America, Africa, Oceania, uh, the other countries that uh, Remy mentioned uh, owe uh, foreign debts, they can't, uh, they really can't uh, create the money for this. And the, uh, the solution is no country should take on foreign official uh, debts in a foreign currency. All debts should be in their own currency not only so governments can pay them, but so governments can cancel them. Because uh, the key to money is debt is debt tends to grow faster than the economy as a whole. And uh, you have to be able to write down debt uh, and writing down debt destroys money. That's uh, part of the complexity uh, that has left uh, socialists uh, not to pay much attention of it. Uh, Marx certainly did pay attention to money uh, and, and banking but he expected it to evolve along industrial capitalist forms as it was doing in Germany and Central Europe in his day. Uh, money and uh, debt have not worked out uh, the way that Marx expected cap uh, industrial capitalism uh, to shape it. Uh, and that's because industrial capitalism has decayed into uh, finance capitalism with its kind of money and debt. That is uh, understanding how capitalism has changed requires an understanding of how money has been privatized by the banks and how debt has ended up burdening the industrial economies, grinding them to a halt. Muchas gracias, Michael. No sé si hay otras personas. Thank you indeed, Michael. I don't know if there are uh, if there's anyone else who would like to take the floor because. Mm, or if someone from the organization can read the questions to us from the Global U. Excuse me, may I make a comment? Can I make just a brief comment? Yes, yes, go ahead, Beatriz. Okay, first of all, for those who don't know me, my name is Beatriz Bistio. I'm from Uruguay, but I've been living for decades in Brazil. Now I'm a teacher at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in the area of political sciences and history. Welcome, Beatriz. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. Uh, it has been a great pleasure for me to listen to all your interventions. So I really want to read Remy's book. So I'm waiting eagerly for it to be published. And it has been a pleasure to, to listen to Paulo. Paulo, we are geographically close, both of us here. You're not very far from the university and where I'm working and where you are working, Paulo. So, and it's also a pleasure to listen to Walter always. I mean, I, I, I haven't met you in person, but I knew you by name. So very briefly, and that's why I asked for the floor because I have to go um, to, to teach now. But anyway, I think it was really important to listen to a summary of the whole book, Remy, mainly chapter number six, Latin America and the chapter on Asia. I think that those are essential reflections when it comes to assessing the importance, for example, of Cuba, understanding or studying the case of Cuba. I do agree also in the assessment uh, analysis that Remy makes saying that maybe the legacy of the Kirchner of the Kirchner administration was not well understood in Argentina and the legacy of the Workers' Party in Brazil. There are some doubts 
Uh, but we're all very much committed to the electoral campaign that is currently ongoing in Brazil because we are having elections next October. So that would be an essential step for Brazil as well as for Latin America to have an election won by ex -pres former ex-president Lula. But we are very much aware of his limitations and also of some of the problems that are still lagging behind uh, from the former PT um, administrations that got worse and uh, even that got worse even during Bolsonaro's administration now. Because of those mistakes, and I think this is the, the background of the US, the Monroe Doctrine, etc. Even in these progressive times that we are experiences, experiencing with Petro in Colombia, with Boric in Chile, welcome all of that, of course. But in terms of what it might mean in terms of a rupture or going moving away from the IMF or from all the machinery that Remy was analyzing before, I think that that's more complex. I think that the margin to maneuver will be more difficult. These new governments will have to face these kind of difficulties. So I need to, to wrap up. Just I want to tell you that from Latin America, a large group of researchers are analyzing what is currently happening in Asia with a lot of interest because it shows that there is a possible future. There is a possible alternative for the future. And yes, yes, if Brazil could give this step ahead and if it could join the BRICS, even with all the limitations that this new progressive government may have, we believe that Latin America could be headed for um, a better road ahead. So thank you again. It's been a great pleasure to listen to all of you. I'm sorry that I have to leave earlier. Big hug to Kim Chi, to Jade, um, that I, I always congratulate you congratulations here again because you're always so consistently bringing these kind of interesting debates to all of us thank you indeed big hug to all of you thank you beatrice i see jade jade could you please uh, gather some questions from the chinese audience i don't see anything I have uh, two questions. Uh, maybe I uh, speak in English because I have two questions. Uh, Remy, could you say more about the uh, 18 uh, year experience of uh, Cuban uh, de dollarization process from 2003 to uh, 2021? Why can Cuba uh, get success? Another uh, question, uh, what are your opinions about Lula new project to create a single Latin American currency, which may strengthen regional integration and end US dollar dependency. And we also have two uh, Chinese um, uh, questions. I will speak in uh, Chinese. So please uh, choose English ch uh, channel. Um, so the first question is, um, Professor Remy, what do you think is the way to Take to um, get out of the control of the capital um, of the financial capital. Second question: How can we get out of the capitalism? So the first one is about uh, the uh, financial capitalism. The second one about the capitalism in general. Before giving the floor, are, are those the uh, questions? I also have one question: Aren't we? before a uh, jubilee that we may forget the periphery, the third world of forgetting the dead? Are there recent conditions for to avoid paying the debt? It was not possible uh, some time ago and now there are credits. Remy, Paolo, you, Walter, you can uh, answer. So if that's all, Let's follow the other Remy, then Paolo, then Walter. And if my, Michael wants to add anything, you are welcome. I'm going to be brief so that we can answer each question that I have 
unless two maybe have not written them down. I will try to do that. Firstly, I agree with Wim. He says we are starting a stage of not only a decline, but also of decay of capitalism with the North leading that. And this stage corresponds to the collapse of the capitalism, every long, slow and contradictory collapse. It will not be immediate, but it's a dangerous process, extremely dangerous, because the powers, dominant powers of current capitalism on its financial form, oligopolistic form, destructive form, which affects the environment and people, these forces, this power will try to remain masters of this situation. So the risk of expanding and deepening the crisis, the crisis, which is a systemic crisis in the sense that the system cannot find a way out using the mechanism of its own logic that is a systemic crisis. There is no way out because the logic of the system does not offer the elites mechanisms to solve the crisis, the contradictions of the crisis. So that means that the perspective in front of us is more wars, more crisis, more suffering. That's why there's an urgent need to reflect and act so that we have a common political action to find alternatives, social and socialist uh, alternatives, if possible. But that's the decision of the peoples who fight. Within this framework, I'd like to say that the war in Ukraine is a complete disaster and a threat a huge threat on world peace. The responsibility of Russia is obvious, but if we want to analyze this seriously, I believe that this is a situation that results from uh, the aggressiveness absurd aggressiveness from the imperialism, from the American imperialism through sanctions against Russia for more than a decade and the progress, if we can call it that way, of the NATO without reflecting, without limitations, without restrictions, U.S. imperialism continues to be what it is, aggressiveness, crisis, wars, and the current European disaster. This is the result of the unfortunate submission before the US and the NATO, the coward, coward, yes, and stupid 
submission of European leaders who do not want to admit that they don't want to accept that the only way to achieve world peace is uh, an alliance between Europe, Russia, and China. That does not mean an uh, economic, aggressive, uh, comprehensive, or military, military alliance against the US. That means a peaceful alliance. For a very long time, the US has been trying to cut relations between Europe and Russia and China. So far, they have found the way, which is the worst way, pressure, putting pressure on Russia so that the only way for it to survive as a multinational country was to defend itself and attack another country, which is unacceptable. But it is even worse to put pressure on a country with the obvious goal of destroying it, of continuing the work they have done in order to dissolve the um, Soviet Union. The responsibility of European leaders is huge and stupid. And every day they increase their stupidity and destructiveness. I believe that European peoples who can slowly understand that they have to radically get away from this destructive strategy developed by their authorities, which means imperialistic wars commanded by the US, by the US government under the control of high finance. The problem is that high finance, among other things, are which are behind all this. That's why I have written this book. There are also several ideas in this book which may seem obvious but complex at the same time. And I'm going to sum them up. Three conclusions, three proposals at a national level. First, to establish, because before that, I would like to say that Paolo has said something that is fundamental. He has said that and for a long time, he mentioned that to me. We have discussed that for a very long time. The domination of US dollar can be the main problem for all monetary policies in all countries. The dollar, the dollar's domination is a problem, but the real problem is behind that because the dollar is just the support, the way capital dominates, one of the main forms of capital domination. Even if we can dream about ending this dollar, US dollar domination through the creation of a world currency, whatever that is, the problem may continue if there is no direct attack against capital domination. Okay, so that is very important. So the proposals in my book, which are related to what I'm with what I'm saying, three at a national level. First, to establish controls to develop change or exchange rate control. Also, control central banks stop this 
useless discussion about the independence of the central bank. That doesn't mean anything because if the central bank depends on political power, that means that it depends on high finance. So there is no independence. It's a false debate. Second, to take control of the central bank in a democratic and participative way, controlled by the people. And third, to socialize better than uh, turn private companies into state-owned companies, the banking system, not not some banks, but all banks, uh, banking system, credit system, insurance system, I think that's how you call it, insurance system, and financial system. A comprehensive control by the public authorities in each country of the financial monetary system at a national level and at an international level we have started a very complicated debate that involves a minimum cooperation among countries but the proposal that WIM has made not to pay debt I agree with that it is uh, how do you say it's unavoidable but we should start with an audit a renegotiation and a partial payment of public debts foreign um, public debts. Also, the development of taxing system at a global level to the ultra-rich and transnational companies and capital flow and the eradication of fiscal havens, we are slowly moving towards that, but we are moving so slow that nobody occurs. Could you could you conclude, Remy, please? So, Beatrice has already left, but it's very important to talk about the situation in Brazil. I don't know what Lula's proposal would be like, but using a currency or a regional monetary space that provides margin for maneuver to each uh, country, that's something good. If Lula is elected, I don't know what's going to, to happen, in fact. Cuba, it's very important, Jade, because Cuba, even when the Cuban economy was dollarized, are you listening to the translation? Can you understand, Jade? When the Cuban economy was dollarized, we could say that the Cuban economy was less dollarized than other Latin American economies that were not dollarized. This is not very complex. The reason behind that is that the Cuban government said, we're going to dollarize and that is a commitment. We will de-dollarize when the conditions are there. Objective and subjective conditions. And when that... 
occurred, the Cuban government stopped the realization. But there was an illusion for some time, that is to say, when the dollarization stopped, that is to say, the use of US dollars, there was an illusion that the Cuban economy was de dollarized. And that was not the case because the US dollar continue to be used after 2004 the cook is being used that is to say the convertible peso but the cook in fact was an equivalent to the dollar it was the representation of productivity of the u.s as um currency, that is to say the dollar. That does not mean that the government was lying but of the revolutionary Cuban government, but they were aware of the fact that they had to keep on fighting against the dollar, even when the dollar was not used. So only when the Cuban peso and the cook were reunified recently in January 2021, we can consider Cuba as being desdollarized. It is quite complex, but Remy, we are running out of time already. Can, can I say something? I, I won't be able to say how to overcome capitalism then. If, if you give me 10 seconds, I can explain how to do that. Um, my, how do you say it? I apologize. Apologies. I apologize to Chinese colleagues, the Chinese colleague that asked that question. Jade, I can, you can share my contact information. I can answer in written. I'm going to conclude by saying that last week, another book was published confronting mainstream economics for overpassing capitalism. It, part of the answer is in that book. It was published by Macmillan in New York. It is in English, but there's a theoretical part about that answer. You can find it in that book. I apologize for speaking so fast and no, I was not very precise, but we don't have much time. Thank you, Remy. We are, yeah, really running out of time. Two hours, two hours and a half was the maximum. So, but I, I want to leave at least uh, the final two or three minutes to all the participants, uh, Paolo, Walter, and Michael as well. If you want to briefly, very briefly, make any final comments or uh, try to answer any of the questions, but please briefly, Paulo, go ahead. Las preguntas son, son, eh, to answer those questions, we would need more time. It would be impossible for me to actually, I, I won't even go there. I won't even give it an attempt. I just wanted, so any final comments? Yes, I just wanted to thank, I mean, I agree with a lot of things that Remy said and Walter said as well. We, I disagree with some as well, but not so, they are not so relevant. But anyway, we, we need more time to continue discussing to, to allow for, for further debate and to see or to try to find a way to advance things. Anyway, I wanted to thank Jade, Kingchi, and all the rest of the comrades and colleagues for this beautiful discussion. So it was just that. Thank you indeed. 
Thank you, Paulo. Walter? Este, igual, okay. ahí sí. Okay, so now can you hear me? Yes, yes, I said now it's working. Okay, same thing as Paulo says. I just want to thank, thank you all. Jade, King Chi, and all the rest of the team. Uh, and as a final, uh, final remark, I hope we would be able to meet soon in Buenos Aires to continue with all these debates. Thank you, Walter. Michael, do you want to wrap up? I want to comment on uh, Remy's prospect for a Latin American currency. Uh, that would require a common tax policy. How can one country's deficit spending, which creates money, be monetized to pay taxes to other Latin American governments, some of which are right-wing, some are left-wing, and if money is political, how do you reconcile left-wing and right-wing governments for a continent-wide currency? Uh, that's really the key to the whole, uh, the whole problem. Uh, I appreciate all of the uh, discussions. I think we all have a common uh, focus on what we want to see. The problem is how to get there. Yo creo que podemos terminar aquí. Yo también okay, quiero. thank you, Michael. I want. I think we can wrap up uh, here. I want to thank myself, Jade and King Chi so much for organizing this session, all the work it implies organizing this whole forum. So I'm truly thankful for being able to be here and to share this day with all of you. Thank you all. Thanks to all the audience and see you next time.